depends on the method that you follow with mafhum is dark and with the definition that you put for the symbolic ritual. Is that clear? Yes. But again, this is up to you to choose. Uh, you're not here to just uh, accept everything I say. Maybe, maybe everything I'm saying is, is wrong now. You never know. This is my understanding, right? And the Shia, we refer to ourselves as al mukhatti'a Have you heard of the term al mukhatti'a the Sunnis, they refer to themselves as Al-Musawwibah. Al-Musawwib means that everything they, cut, they end is, is correct. Right? We say al mukhatti'a that we, we have no complete certainty in the conclusions that we reach. Only the Ma'asum gives us the complete certainty. Right? We say this is what we are able to understand. This is what we are able to reach in, in our discussion, in our ishtihad. And Allah, Allah, maybe it's correct, maybe it's not. Allah, Allah. Okay? This is the mukhatiya. So we don't claim, no one from the Shia scholars say, I have the complete knowledge and I have the inspiration from Allah. They say, we studied, we looked, we spent time, and this is what we're able to end up with. You accept that you believe in this scholar, follow him. You don't believe in this scholar, follow another scholar. This is the concept of taqlid. All good so far? Okay. We'll go to, after explaining it, we'll go to the first uh, Sha'ira, the, surf, uh, the first symbolic ritual, which is Tadbir, or uh, what did you call it? Kamazani? Kamazani. I have to practice my. my what is it? Tad, explaining what Tadbir is? Have you heard of spelling? T A. Yeah. Do you write in Arabic? Do you write it in Arabic? <laughs> no, see, he writes better than me. Did you put Tadbir? Tadbir. <laughs> yeah, well, we usually, I've taught. Um, uh, Mostly uh, Arab students, so it's easier for them to, to pick it up. Tadbir yeah, yeah. uh, means uh, what did we what did we say? Self flagellation, where you hit your, or some people hit their head with a sword and blood comes out on their forehead. I'm sure you've you've seen that. Right? Yeah, do you want to do it now? Did you give us an example? We'll add it to the video of someone doing it. They say Haidar, Haidar, Haidar. And when they go to Ziyara, you find this uh, hitting themselves. Eh? And it's famous in certain uh, places, very famous. In, in Iraq, in Pakistan. You see someone who is his whole back split. Yeah. Now, with the origins of Tadbir, or what is the history behind Tadbir? Also, you have more than one view. We have four views for the origins of Tadbir. Where did it come from? This is historically, not Islamically. We'll end up with the Islamic view. Before we continue, just, are we talking about just Tadbir or any kind of self-flagellation where you have harm to the body? Now, now we're speaking about the act of Tadbir, that is very famous. Uh, what they refer to as the that Zanji, we'll speak about it later. But it's more famous the Tadbir, the sword. Uh, and Tadbir is older than the other uh, act, or if you want to call them the rituals. The first view is for Shaheed Mutahari, Rahmatullahi Alayhi. Shaheed Mutahari. It took the opinion that tadbir or self-flagellation was from the practices of the Christians that eventually found its way through the Orthodox Christians of Quqaz. Have you heard of Quqaz? Quqaz is on the border of Europe. It includes, uh, today it includes Russia, Georgia, um, Azerbaijan, Armenia this region. There was uh, Orthodox Christians there and they used to practice this on Easter. 
Until today, there are some who still practice this, on, some Christians who still practice this. You've, have you seen it? Uh, on YouTube, put it on Easter, Orthodox Christians, Philippines and other places, South America and other places, they do that. And even in the church, some, some priests, they, they, they practice this self-flagellation. They hit themselves with the zanjir. If they commit a sin, they sit down and repent to, to do it. So, Shaheed Mutahir Rahmatullah believes that it came from the Christians, the Orthodox Christians of Quqaz, the, on the borders of Europe. The second view is for uh, Dr. Ali Shariati Rahmatullah Ali. Shariati, he accepted the same view as Mutahari, but he added a time frame for for this act when it's moved to the Shia uh, time or the Shia places. He said the time frame is during the Safawi Empire. The Safawis who ruled Iran. During their time, the Tadbir, it moved from the Christians of Quqaz to Iran and the Shia started practicing it there. Okay? His book, famous book uh, comparing At-Tashayyu al-Alawi with At-Tashayyu al-Safawi Dr. Ali Shariati so he, he he gives an example of showing how this Tashayyu changed from the path of the Ahlul Bayt salam, to the path of the Safawis uh, interesting book obviously we don't accept everything Dr. Ali Shariati uh, mentions in his books and he has some views that are against the the mainstream and what we believe in uh, or our aqidah, especially when it comes to the Prophet Sallallahu but also you'll find some beneficial things in his book. Aren't they some of his books which are not allowed to read? Uh, not allowed to read. If, if, someone, if, if someone is going to uh, become misguided from reading, yes, it becomes haram to read any book of misguidance. But if someone is strong in his beliefs, there's no problem to read any book, right? There's no problem. And I don't personally believe in um, what we what I call intellectual terrorism. You can't just uh, issue a statement against a scholar that you disagree with and say you you're not allowed to read his books. Why? Yes, again, if someone is simple, doesn't have the knowledge, yes, you, t you tell him don't waste your time and go through the headache. But if someone wants to read, wants to look at different views, what's the problem in that? So I personally don't find a problem if people want to read for Dr. Ali Shariati, because as I said, some of his books are very beneficial, although we don't agree with everything mentioned in, in, in there. So you accept what goes with the mainstream and you reject the things that go against the, the mainstream. If you're not on this level, then don't waste your time or go through this headache. Um, the third view is for a scholar who is still alive today in, in Qom. His name is Sheikh Haidar Hubbullah. Sheikh Haidar Hubbullah. He teaches in the Hausa of Qom. He teaches Bahath Kharish. And he has some... Uh, interesting discussions today about different topics, very beneficial topics. Uh, lately they started translating some of his tafsir classes to English, so you'll find that online. It's interesting that this sheikh, he teaches uh, all qualified scholars who wear turbans, and he himself, he doesn't wear a turban. He wears a, a suit and he sits down. He doesn't, he doesn't wear a turban. Okay, and he's a mushtahid, a strong scholar that teaches scholars, but he doesn't he doesn't wear uh, uh, this uh, this dress coat. So I don't know why, but it's a smart move from him. It's uh, it's easier for him to travel around to move around. But maybe yes 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 maybe so in certain places. It's better to promote Islam. We'll go to the symbolic rituals. <laughs> should we follow the same symbolic rituals or should we change? 
Unfortunately, I was not mature enough when, 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 when I was forced to wear this uh, dress code. And it becomes very difficult later on to, to g get out of it. But, alhamdulillah for everything. So this third view for Sheikh Haidar Hubbullah, he adopted the opinion that the origins of Tadbir was during the Qajari Empire. Have you heard of the Qajari Empire? <laughs> Q A J A R I. There's no one way of writing these terms. You can write it any way you any way you want. So when it's the Qajari Empire. The Qajaris they ruled Iran from seventeen eighty five to nineteen twenty five. The Qajari Empire. So he says Sheikh Haider Habbal. So, ITBC, Hijri, you mean or what? Yeah, is it Hijri? Is it English? English, English, Miladi. Okay. Yeah, Miladi. <laughs> so, after the birth of uh, Christ, 1785 to 1925. He believes that it started from there through a, a man by the name of Al Fadl, Fadl, Ad Darabandi. Ad Darabandi. Fadl, Ad Darabandi. Do you want me to write down his name or? It's one, Ad Darabandi. Fadl Ad Darabandi. He is the one, again, there's no correct way of writing it. You can write it any way you want. Fadl Ad Darabandi. He is the one who was responsible for moving this act to, to the Shia uh, communities. Al Fadl Ad Darabandi during the Qajari time. Fourth view for a person by the name of Ahmad Al Amiri Al Nasiri. Ahmad Al Amiri A O A M I R I Nasiri N A S I R I Ahmad Al Amiri Nasiri. This man he has a book about Tadbir. He adopted the opinion that Tadbir moved to Iran from the Ottoman Empire. The Ottoman Empire, they had an army by the name of the Inkishari Army. <laughs> the Inkishari Army. Inshallah, the notes will be online also. So if you misspell one of the words, you can fix it later on. Inkishari Army. They had a certain ritual that they used to perform in the army, the Inkishari. It's interesting to read about them. And it was moved from, from the Ottoman Empire to the Safawis in, in, in Iran. Now, obviously, with, we, don't, we can't accept the fourth view that it was from the Ottoman Empire. You know why? Why? He said yes. He said yes. We can't accept it. Why? Because the actions were prior to the Ottoman Empire that came in. No, no, that's not the only reason. There's another reason why we, you can't accept it. We don't like the Ottoman Empire. Well, I don't like the Ottoman Empire, of course, but there's another reason. <laughs> why don't I like the Ottoman Empire? <laughs> Do you like the Ottoman Empire? Unless you're watching this uh, new I series, the, the resurrection of Ortogut. They kept talking about it. I had to go watch like hundred, hundred uh, series of this show. What a waste of time! Uh, why do you? Why do we have a stance against the, the Ottoman Empire? Who were they? No, no, as as Shia. Why? So, what did you say? So the 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 the, the, the Safavis. Their first enemy was the Ottoman Empire. The Safavis were the Shia who ruled Iran. Shah Ismail al Safawi. Haven't you heard of Shah Ismail al Safawi? He ruled Iran and he changed the faith of or the madhab of the people back then from Sunni to Shia in Iran by force in certain places, which obviously were unaccepted today. And he, and he, and he, he, he got more than 80 scholars from South Lebanon to Iran. Sheikh al-Baha'i, his father, Sheikh al-Kaf'ami, Sheikh al-Maysi, al-Alam al-Maysi, and he gave them the power there. 
to spread the, 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 the madhab. The first enemy was the Ottoman Empire, well then. So it's against the intellect to accept that the, the Safavis would, would adopt the practices of their enemies. You would never adopt the practice of your enemy, correct? Huh? <laughs> yes, you will be true. So it makes more sense after following the different historical books that speak about this topic to say that what Shahid al Mutahari said, Rahmatullah, is more authentic. And what Dr. Shari'ati mentioned is more accurate of the time frame that it was moved during the time of the Safawis, not during the time of the Qajaris, and from the Christians of the Orthodox Christians of Caucasus. Okay, this is from a historical point of view. We're all good so far? So basically, it's for, from a historical point of view, it's originated from Iran. Yes, there's no doubt that it started from Iran. Correct. Okay, historically, it started from there. Yeah. Not Islamically, now we'll speak Islamically about it. Historically, it started from there, in Iran. Whether during the Qajari, the Safawis, from the Orthodox Christians or not, it started from Iran. Now to the Islamic narrations about Tadbir. With my research, when I've done my research, I didn't include the Islamic narrations. Then one of the one of the, my friends who wrote notes on this research, he included some of the Islamic narrations. And I think it's important to mention them in the course, to, to, to look at them, uh, to look at what he, he, he mentioned as, as notes. And I want you to do the same thing, inshallah, by the end of this course, to come up with your own views about this, uh, this topic, so we can include it maybe under, under this research. Okay, inshallah. Sayyid Ahmed Hakim, one of the, my friends, he said, when he looked at the narrations. He found three narrations about this topic. Three narrations that are used in, uh, in uh, Tadbir or for Tadbir. The first narration, or the most famous narration, wa Alam al-Majlisi, rahmatullah alayh, mentions in Biharul Anwar. Biharul Anwar is a very famous book, volume 45, page 114, 115. Volume? Volume 45, page 114-115. I'm sure you've heard of this narration that Sayyidah Zainab السلام, when she saw the head of her brother السلام, she struck her head on a pillar and blood came out on her forehead. This narration is mentioned, he says in the narration, Zainab السلام, turned her face and saw the face of her brother السلام, and as a result struck her head upon a pillar and we saw with our own eyes that blood started to come down. This is the narration. Now, at the beginning of this narration, Alam al-Majlisi, rahmatullah alayhi, he says, he says, I found in some reliable books narrated in a disconnected fashion. Disconnected fashion means mursal. What is the meaning of mursal? Mursal is when you have a narration with no chain or with no complete chain. So it says it's narrated from, and then there's no one else. There's no chain for it. To link it back to the masul, to link it back to the imam. This is the meaning of mursal. A disconnected fashion of a narration where you don't have a complete chain. From Muslim Ajjassas, this is the one who narrated, from Allah knows who. Maybe inspiration came down on this man, we don't know. But he says he found it in a reliable book. To depend on this narration from a jurisprudential perspective is problematic for two reasons. There's two reasons why we can't depend on this narration. The first reason, we are not aware which book Al-Majlisi found this in. He didn't mention the name of the book. Now I can mention to you a narration and say I found it in a book. What book? 
And how many sometimes speakers, when when they come to a corner, they come up with a hadith. Sometimes they're speaking on the member, they come up with a hadith. You ask them, where did this hadith come from? They start telling you, Bihar, Ul Anwar, volume this, volume that. You go check, you don't find it. So we can't rely on something without a source. He doesn't mention to us the where where the, what book he, he he found this narration with in. Also Al Majlisi, those who studied in the Hausa or those who look at the science of hadith, they know that what Al Majlisi considers to be reliable back then, used to consider to be reliable, is not accepted today by scholars. So the method that is used in accepting, rejecting narrations in the past is different than the method that is used in accepting or rejecting narrations today. You get it? Due, due to us not having the source of this book, we can't accept it as an evidence. The second problem is that the narration is narrated through a disconnected fashion, mursal, a mursal hadith, meaning there's no chain. When there's no chain or there's no complete chain, we consider the narration to be weak, daif, correct? Now with the, uh, oh, good so far with that, with this narration? Yes. So what's, what was the difference between the uh, checking the sources and the accepting and rejecting books? The method, the difference the method. between the method? So today if you look at, for example, in uh, the, the, the akhbaris, they have certain methods different than the usulis in accepting and rejecting certain narrators, okay? Or in the way they accept a, narr a, a narration. Is it done through wuthuq or tawthiq? There's different ways of just con looking at the chain itself or looking at other um, uh, things. We'll explain that, inshallah, when we speak about the different, different methods in, in the future. But there's different met methods that exist in accepting and rejecting. It's interesting to know that the pro-Tadbir scholars, those who promote or defend Tadbir, they still accepted this narration as reliable. Although it doesn't have any source, it doesn't have a chain, but still they accepted it as reliable. In defending, they say, when it comes to historical events, you don't need an authentic chain. Correct? And this is a historical event, so you don't need an authentic chain for it. Same as many events that we believe in today, that we commemorate today, there's no authentic chains for them. Mm. Yet we still accept them. What do you say? Do you accept this? Hmm? History, if you want to follow only the authentic events in history, you end up with one or two pages. <laughs> there's nothing, nothing authentic. <laughs> Because history is written by the winners, those who are in authority. So, do you accept this or not? Do you accept it? If you accept this, then you can accept this narration. And you say the origin of Tadbir is from Sayyidah Zainab alayhi salam. But if you look at, look at it from a logical perspective, then, because if the narrations don't work, then we come back and talk about, take it at a logical level, yep. would Sayyidah Zainab do that, number one. So we need to understand Sayyidah Zainab's um, an understanding of how she would have acted in that situation. Mm -hmm. Difficulty in life situation. At that time, at that so time, you, in her personality. Her you can't use logical mind. evidence mm -hmm. in that sense of not accepting Sayyidah Zainab to do that when you want to look at the narration. Mm -hmm. You can't. But then you can even look at history again when they were um, given the ijazah to leave and uh, Bibi Zainab asked for three things and one of them was a room to actually uh, mourn for the Shaheed before they actually left mm. for, from Syria. 
So when all the I think the head had come and yep. uh, everybody was all the ladies especially yep. they were out of control. So I I think I can understand and I can accept it. As uh, as something she she done something um, she reacted emotionally yeah. for a, for a tragedy that she saw in front of her eyes. Yeah. But I, I, I think the question is on the principles would you accept an innovation that doesn't have? Any yeah. So away from what you uh, imagine or what you what what is close to your heart or not. It's, it's it's a method. It's a method that it's, you follow. It's not whether yeah. she would or she wouldn't. Well, could you look at? Uh, different ahadith, the guy, the person is narrated. Or different ahadith? Or something else is narrated which is, it matches the other authentic sources or not. Yeah. You mean in, in, uh, in accepting the narrator of this narration? Yeah. yeah. This is one of the methods, of course, of looking at different, different narrations that he narrated to see whether he's authentic or not. Uh, but the, the thing is, this uh, chain can be made up by some enemies. So they can add the name of someone and make up a, a chain. And if you don't have the source, which is the book that, is, that was written in it, or the complete chain, it becomes problematic. Right? Mm. To, to, give you, to give you an answer, we say in history, it is true that you don't need to have uh, certainty in, in, in the authenticity of every single event. You can accept certain events based on what we refer to as tawatur. Tawatur means when you receive and use from different places or from, from different sources, right? At the same time. Let me give you an example. If now, Someone comes into to this uh, room and he says to us, there's a fire outside. You say, this man is not Shia. Based on the principles of hadith, I can't accept his, his saying. Okay, because he's not Shia. Another one comes in, he says to you, there's fire outside. You look at him, you say, he's not Muslim. I can't accept his saying. A third uh, one, a third woman comes in without a scarf, for example. You say, oh, she's not wearing a scarf, I don't accept her as a, as a, as a, as a, as a source. Fourth one comes in drinking, <laughs> for example. You can't say he's drinking. But then you sit down, you say, well, this, how, how many sources told me there's, it's possible that there's something outside. Correct? This is what we mean with tawatur, a simple way of explaining what tawatur means. So in history, if you have different sources narrating a certain incident, then you say this can be used as an evidence. Okay? At Tawatur. The problem is that this narration, there's no different sources that narrate it, narrates it. Thus it says Tawatur. Tawatur, the source is one. The source is one and it's unknown. Majlisi narrated it from, his, from an unknown book and the other scholars started narrating it in their books. You can't come today and tell me it's narrated in 50,000 books. Inshallah, it's in million books. It doesn't make any difference as long as the source is one. There's no tawatur here. You get it? Sheikh, um, does it, uh, uh, matter if, um, obviously all these things that we're discussing, do they really have that much importance compared to if in the beginning, what we discussed about sometimes uh, ritual actions do not have to be in hadith or history for yeah, us yeah. to practice them again, for them to be a reminder of me for Allah. Yeah. If you accept this view, then there's no need for you to find an Islamic evidence. But if you don't accept this view, like Sayyid al khui like some of his uh, students, if there's no evidence in the narration, then it can't be classified as a symbolic ritual. Mm. Yeah. So that's why some scholars, they try or push to prove it through this. We have no, again, here, I have to make it clear because we're not going to end with a conclusion today about this topic. Uh, I'm not pro or against any, any, any ritual, right? We'll see at the end where we're going to end up with. We're just giving the, the views here. Okay. 
so for example, um, no, we'll go back to this uh, point. So even if we accept that something reached a level of tawatur historically, historically, not always you can use it in fiqh, in jurisprudence. And seeing that this narration, it didn't reach the level of tawatur, it can't be used as a historical evidence, and it can't be used in fiqh, because it didn't use the level of tawatur. For an argument's sake, if we say we accept it, based on the principle, let's say, of amal al-mashhur, the scholars who accepted it, we say that this action is an emotional reaction, uncontrolled reaction that was done by Sayyidina Zainab salam. And it doesn't go under the title of symbolic rituals. It wasn't done to promote re- religion. It wasn't done to promote Islam or to promote the message of Imam Hussein. It's only an emotional reaction that happened from Sayyidina Zainab salam. So in both cases, it doesn't go under the category of the symbolic rituals. You get it? Okay. The second narration that is used by some is mentioned by Mirza Nuri At-Tabrasi. Mirza Nuri At-Tabrasi. Mirza Nuri At-Tabrasi. He has a book by the name of Darul Islam. Darul Islam fi ma yata'allaqu bil ru'yati wal manam. Too hard to write, to write it down. Darul Islam who translated the, 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 the Darul Islam, the city of Islam, in what is concerned with uh, dreams and visions. Mm-hmm. Dreams and visions. So that, you can put Darul Islam only for Tabrasi, then you'll find it online. You put Darul Islam for Nur Tabrasi, and you'll find this. Uh, you know Darul Salam. Darul Salam in uh, Tanzania, right? Yeah, yeah. Tanzania here. Yeah, mashallah. Yeah. You don't want to connect to the, this uh, book anyway. <laughs> <laughs> so in this book, Darul Salam, volume 2, page 200. Volume 2, page 200. He mentions what he calls a narration. That a Christian, a Christian guy came to Imam Zainul Abidin alayhi salam and he narrated to him a dream that he saw. The Christian guy narrated to Imam Zainab in a dream. When Imam alayhi salam heard this dream, he hit his head on the wall and blood started coming out. He hit his head on the wall and blood started to come out. This is why some people today, they refer to this as a ritual. They call it at-tantih. Tantih means hitting your, your head in the wall. So they stand and they run to a wall and they hit their, their heads for blood to come out based on this yeah so this story also was mentioned without a chain and it's mentioned in a book that speaks about visions and dreams so we can't accept it i don't know what the dream was the, the <laughs> For, for context as to why they yeah, so about the story that he told him, the story that he told him in, in, in the dream. Uh, he um, Speaking about his father, speaking about the tragedies, and uh, out of his grief, he, he reacted emotionally. You can refer back to the, the source and read the story. Also, there's no chain for this narration. There's no chain. And again, for argument's sake, if there is a chain, we say this is an emotional reaction and it can't be included under the, the symbolic rituals. The third narration, the third narration, which is used by some Shia, but it was mentioned in a Sunni book. A Sunni book for Muhibbuddin, Muhibbuddin, at Tabari. Al-Shafi'i. Muhibbuddin al-Tabari al-Shafi'i. His book called Lam Takun Ridda. Lam, L-A-M, Takun, T-A-K-U-N, Ridda, R-I-D-D-A. Ridda, Lam Takun Ridda, page 
page 272. He mentions the action of Bani Asad. It's referred to as the action of Bani Asad. The action of Bani Asad. It is narrated that when this tribe, Bani Asad, when they came to Karbala after the martyrdom of Imam Hussein and they heard of the news of the martyrdom of the Imam salam, they struck their heads with swords until blood came out. So when they saw this, they started striking their heads with swords until blood came out. Most pro tadbir scholars that don't use this narration because it's mentioned by a Sunni source. Some of them, they still use it and accept it. So for example, to give you an example, that, that this, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll quote what this brother uh, put down in, in the notes. So if someone wants to attack, he, they can attack him, not, not, not me. He mentions the views, the view of one of the maraja today. One of the famous maraja today, his name is Sayyid Sadiq Rouhani. Have you heard of Sayyid Sadiq Rouhani? He's one of the students of Sayyid Khoui. And he's one of the big maraja in Qom today. May Allah prolong his life. He's known to be a strong scholar from the school of thought of Sayyid al khui On his website, Sayyid Rouhani's website, he was asked about this incident. He was asked a question about the incident of Bani Asad and the incident of Sayyidah Zainab salam, Both of them. He says, in, in the first answer, he says, they are both found in our books and both are reliable. They are both find, found in our books. Now, with the story of Sayyidah Zainab salam, you find it in our books in Bihar al-Anwar without a source. But with the story of Bani Asad, which book did you find it in? It's a Sunni book. Okay. So this is the first answer. He says they are found in our books and they are reliable. In another similar question, they ask him another question on his website. The source is there. You find it in the notes online. He was asked the same question about the story of Sayyidah Zainab and the story of Bani Asad. He says, he says, we have mentioned in previous replies in the first answer that the narration of the pillar that Zainab salam, struck her head is reliable. Yes, he mentioned this. As for the narration regarding Bani Asad, it does not exist in any of our reliable books. Is he answering himself or the... <laughs> we'll get to that. <laughs> it would be good. The next generation of the Maraja, you'll find them. You'll find them sitting on, uh, online. But I hope they don't start taking selfies and put it on Instagram and Facebook. <laughs> Here, this uh, brother who put down this note, he said, and I'll quote him, he says, this contradiction is sadly not unusual to find in the rulings of Sayyid Sadiq al Rouhani, where our experience has shown that they are many. In many rulings, there's a lot of contradictions, according to what he says. Now, as the brother said, is he the one recording, is, uh, no, is he the one uh, answering the questions? No, it's not. It's not the marja himself who sits down and answers the question. The brother here, he said, whether this is due to a change of view or a lack of attention is unknown. So maybe he changed his view from the first answer to the second answer. Or maybe it was done unintentionally. Or maybe, as the brother said, it's not him who, who, who answers the, the question. It depends on who is answering the questions. On your luck, when you send the question, whoever opens this, this, uh, this question at the office of the marja will answer. Sometimes he gives his own view. The marja he doesn't know what's going on between them. Is this not right? Of course it's not right. Yeah, it it's not, it's not. I think it also happens with Sayyid Sistani's yes. website. It's full of the English version. Yes. It's full. Sometimes it uh, 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 depends on, this, on the on the on the share. Possible for him to actually check. Yeah. All the, uh, there are some there are some rulings that the marja puts his stamp on or he writes down. Yeah. Then they take a photo of it and uh, 
And this is very, very, pro uh, it's a big problem today because you can't reach the marja himself. Okay? It's not easy for you to reach the marja. Even if you reach the marja, 